So I'm Federica and I'm a member of Fast Forward Labs. And I'm an engineer, but I think I'm a different kind of engineer than uh, a lot of people in the audience, because I'm a software engineer, and then within that, I'm a machine learning research engineer. So I spend pretty much all my life sort of just in the digital and don't really have to worry so much about the analog, except for when I like I get up after a day of work and I try to get home on the subway. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the realistic promise of smart machines, because my area of expertise is machine learning, and I define machine learning essentially as using computers in order to find patterns in large amounts of data, and then using those patterns to provide insight or to make decisions, sometimes automated decisions. Some people also call that AI, um, artificial intelligence. I come, my background was in neuroscience, so I went from biological to artificial intelligence, and there's a little secret that like, I don't actually know what people mean when they talk about AI. Um, I'm going to use AI in this talk um, because it is a word that people use, but I think it is not very well defined. And so let's stick with machine learning and say machine learning is the practice where you use computers and a lot of compute power in order to look at data and extract patterns that you can use um, in your own practice. And I would love to be a mixologist, really. <laughs> I was very inspired by the previous talk. Um, I'm more like, I would say, a digital tool maker. And so that's what I'm going to talk about here. I'm the last person today, so I was mindful of that. And I'm going to make this talk hopefully entertaining to you. I'm going to take you through a number of um, recent incidences where machine learning made the news, which is surprising to me. This is a very sort of stuffy and geeky field. And yet we have been in the news recently. Um, and the way how it's discussed, I think, is not very helpful if you actually want to solve problems together. And so I discuss some of those incidences and show some of those examples. The first I want to briefly introduce what we actually do so that you know where I'm coming from. And in a way, I'm like also like Randy, sort of a fly on the wall, because I don't know much about architecture, construction, or engineering, though I'm really fascinated by it. And it was really sort of inspiring today to listen to the talks. So we are a relatively small team. We were seven people when we got acquired, so quite a small company. Um, and the original mission of Fast Forward Labs was to take research um, knowledge that's sort of been cultivated and developed within academia, largely within computer science, machine learning, also in neuroscience, and help bring that research into industry, help it find good applications. Because as it is, like, there's so much knowledge that's being, I like the word cultivated, in academia that could find applications much faster, but we sort of lack good mechanisms to speed up that sort of transition of knowledge. In a way, it is really all about sort of disciplines coming together, really, um, or different practices coming together, like the previous talk sort of uh, emphasized. And so, quite rightly so, I think we are in the sort of age of the when. <laughs> I'm showing one here. So Fast Forward Labs, we positioned ourselves to interact with startups. So companies that try to build a business around new ideas, very exciting, it's very exciting to sort of learn about Iris and what you're doing sort of with VR in this space. I think that's really inspiring. So we look at startups and sort of try to see interesting ideas. Of course, we also um, have ties in academic research. Largely, everyone uh, working at Fast Forward has an academic background, though, in different disciplines. Um, and then we largely also work with big companies. And there's one reason why, A, they have money. And we need it. Uh, we, we are a business. Um, but also, um, over the years, they've like accumulated large amounts of data, and so have you most likely in your practice, right? And that data you can put to really good use. And that is what we find exciting, which is why we, we sort of positioned ourselves at this intersection. And what we do, there are three different kinds of activities that we do. So uh, fundamentally, we do very hyper-applied machine learning research. So we try and identify tools and technologies within computer science, machine learning, statistics, uh, and some sort of adjacent fields. And we try to predict which ones are going to find applications in industry within the next six months to two years. And that time frame makes us hyper-applied and also it helps us verify whether our predictions are right. If you are going to tell me what's going to happen in 2050, it's very unlikely that we're going to talk then, right? And so I can't hold you accountable. We try to hold, uh, hold ourselves accountable here. Um, the output from the research process are sort of uh, research monographs and also working prototypes. Again, this is like sort of the philosophy, if you don't know how to build it, 
then you also don't really understand what it is and what you're working with. We also work with corporate clients in order to help them understand machine learning technology and bring more of it into their business, so that is the workshop and advising. The prototypes, we don't only build prototypes as part of our research, but also um, if they're sort of like interesting novel applications in, in particular industries, we like to get into that as well. Um, so my sort of tagline for Fast Forward is basically, we like to think about sci-fi and then keep it real. Um, and here's sort of one example. It's one of our like, research monographs. The first one that we ever did was for natural language generation two and a half years ago. Here's a prototype that we did. Um, it's basically you enter structured data uh, it's an apartment here that has five bedrooms, it's in midtown, laundry in the building, has a doorman, pads allowed, and then at that point you hit generate a listing, and this is basically an algorithm that is constructing real estate listings. And um, it's constructing a whole range of them, and then it scores them based on how good it thinks this description, this listing is, and then it services the one with the highest score. They're not necessarily perfect, but if you sort of think about someone who's writing real estate listings, if you have a template, you're a lot faster in writing those listings, right? And really, um, this prototype that we built, um, it's, it's sort of, it's specific to real estate, but this is a technology that can be applied in many different areas where essentially you have structured data and then you um, want to put it into text that people actually like to read. So think about dashboards, right? Or think about sort of any kind of like financial reporting, that is structured data that you can convey in a different form and you can use algorithms to write that text. Um, one thing, for example, that I like about it that may not be immediately available here is like you can imagine that the language that's being used in order to describe a department on the Upper West Side is very different from the language that you would use to describe an apartment in Bushwick, which is where I live, right? And this algorithm is able to actually sort of like adapt to the kind of language that would be used in different areas. And that really is sort of the, the, the promise of machine learning in this particular area. Other work that we did was on natural language summarization. So here the problem is that a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information in the world and I'm sure all of you have that, like I wish I had more time to read and I don't. Um, and so it would be great if, like, for some articles, maybe not novels that I like, but some articles, if I could easily get a more sort of condensed version of it, right? A summary. And so we built a prototype that, get this running. Essentially, you go to a website that has a long form article that you find interesting. You take the URL, you hit on summaries, and then at that point, um, it basically is a Chrome plugin. It will sort of like highlight the sentences in yellow that are most representative of the content, or just blend the other ones out that are not deemed to be as representative of the content, then you just have to read those five, and that um, enables you to essentially digest information much faster, and that summary is, again, derived by an algorithm. Specifically, this is a recurrent neural network. Um, and we used it, actually, um, in order to create the summary of the sort of back of our uh, report. Something else that we did, we don't only work with language, we try to sort of cover different areas, we also looked into image analysis. And here, um, we built a prototype where you can essentially put in your Instagram handle, it takes all of your pictures and then it groups them, it essentially creates a profile of what you like to take pictures of. Tourism Island likes to take pictures of natural depressions, shops, fortifications and rail fences. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Bleaker Burger is an interesting one. Um, Rika Burger likes to take pictures of hamburgers, dishes, um, and crabs. Now that's funny. Um, let's look at that. So these are pictures that have been identified as crabs, but what do we see? Yeah, they're french fries, right? So I'm showing this um, for a reason. So we built these prototypes largely as educational tools because we want people to understand the promise of these technologies. So we want to highlight um, using a concrete example, what these can do, and that's why we really built these prototypes. Here is one application, right? But since they're sort of educational tools, we also like to show where the limits are, right? Because you will never get to a 100% solution. That's impossible, right? And if you, that's sort of the, the luxury in academia. If you get to like 90%, as long as you're better at your colleagues, you've won, right? But if, if you build... Um, a consumer product and you make like a, a, a mistake, like the consumers may not be that forgiving, 
right? And so you have to now design these software products, uh, keeping in mind that there will be mistakes, right? Um, and as much as you try to perfect it, you probably won't capture all of them, right? And so that is why we actually, why I like to talk about this, and this is why we include it. And here, the most likely reason is that actually in the training data that we use to train the algorithm to do this detection of the content in the images, there were not a lot of images of french fries by the water, but there were a lot of images of crabs by the water that kind of also looked like the french fries with the mayo and ketchup things on it, right? Um, and so that is one of the challenges, really. Like Because machine learning is really about detecting patterns that's in the data, it also largely relies on what is in the data. What's not in the data, it can't capture, right? And that has actually created a, a range of complications. Maybe some of you have heard about racist algorithms. That is a reality. <laughs> um, so let's get back to the sort of realistic promise of smart machines after this brief overview of our work. And it's really motivated by this. Like, the world seems to be currently quite in love with AI, and a lot of businesses seem to be in love with AI, but it doesn't quite know why. And honestly, I'm sometimes surprised as well by the amount of love that we receive. Um, and I want to sort of talk about now the, the sort of cases where AI made the news. And two days ago, actually, it, it sort of made headlines in some publications, and that was related to the game Go. Um, people have, who is familiar with the game Go? Okay, a few people. So, I mean, basically, I'm not a Go player. I've never played Go. Um, but it's kind of like a super, it's like chess, but more complicated, because you only have like two types of stones, and there are many more possible board configurations, and that makes it a sort of more complex game. Um, and two days ago, and I sort of like got a, just a few headlines, and um, this happened, right? So um, Google DeepMind created a Go playing agent, AlphaGo Zero, and it shows that machines can become superhuman without any help. Um, this more powerful version of AlphaGo learns on its own, um, and so forth, and so forth. And so that's kind of an example, and I want to dig a little bit deeper. So what happened here? So actually, I think this was like two years ago, 2015, they built not AlphaGo Zero, but AlphaGo. It was the first time that sort of really Go and, and AI Go agents made the news, and, and that agent defeated 18-time world champion Lee Sedol in the game Go. And you know, we remember that it was a big do deal when sort of IBM um, won in chess, um, and this is a more complicated game, so it's a bigger deal. Right, so that's how it is. Um, and so everyone was excited, and then there were a lot of um, sort of news publications that then talk about the singularity and talk about the fact that you know we have to be careful and these machines will become conscious and all of that. But ultimately, I, I sort of chose this quote because this is very much a reflection of current reality. AlphaGo is a narrow AI system that can play Go, and that's it. The Atari game playing agents from DeepMind do not use the approach taken with Go. The Google search engine is not going to use Go. AlphaGo does not generalize to any problem outside of Go. So, AlphaGo is good at playing Go, and that's it. And I don't think we have to be afraid of an algorithm that is good at playing Go. <laughs> um, also, and that's important, it's, it only works because the developers of this algorithm uncovered a few conveniences about the game Go that they exploited to build this um, very smart AI, yeah, smart at playing Go. So Go is fully deterministic, right? If I put the same sequence of actions out on the board, like the, I, I get the same outcome. Also, if I take a look at the board, I know exactly where the game is at, right? There's nothing hidden. Poker is very different. I look at my cards, I don't know the cards that the other person has, right? It's a very different kind of game. Um, most important, um, you have access to a perfect simulator, the game itself, right? Like you can simulate how the game is going to go. I take this move, you take this move and so forth, right? So you can compute all possible worlds. And also, with Go, there are short games with very clear outcomes and very clear like wins and losses. And like real world is not like that, right? It, it takes a very long time to understand whether a decision that you made was actually good or bad, and then makes it very difficult for, for AI agents to learn. Um, now, this one is about the AlphaGo Zero that everyone is now so excited about as of two days ago. And what's so great about it? Indeed, it learned without any human game playing data. So it didn't take any data about humans playing Go during its training. And it learned pretty quickly. And that's great. But if we sort of go back, like it still exploits all the other conveniences, really. And so it isn't as big of a breakthrough as, as it's been portrayed. 
And in a way, it uses reinforcement learning. So basically what it does, it simulates different actions on the board. It plays against itself, and then it remembers who won, and then it sort of like basically says, okay, the, the moves that are used in the game when I won, they're good moves. So do them again and don't do the other ones. And that's sort of how it learns. And it's very similar to this old saying that if you take a, a bunch of monkeys and a bunch of sort of like typewriters, eventually they'll write Shakespeare. It's like the same thing, right? And because we have very powerful computers now, we can essentially simulate this process. And that is how, um, how these agents can become so smart because they learn during, on the way like what resembles Shakespeare language and what doesn't. Um, but what is exciting, and you highlight the addition to the code, but the people and the underlying neural network components do. They do generalize to problems outside of Go and do so much more effectively than in the days of old AI where each demonstration needed repositories of specialized explicit code because now we learn from data. And so that leads to the conclusion that AlphaGo Zero Let Go is essentially a very clever combination of known components to achieve a goal uh, better than any known, so known solution for a well, well understood problem. And that is something, that's where I sort of was going with this little AlphaGo and uh, Go excursion. That is the secret recipe of any successful machine learning and AI product. So basically what you need is you need known components, machine learning tools. You need to know how to use them to combine them cleverly and then you can apply them to problems that you understand well. And that requires collaboration, which is why I really love the talk that came before me, because they, when it comes to architecture, engineering, and construction, you guys understand the problem. <laughs> right? I, I have no idea about the problems that you guys are facing, but I'm a tool maker, and I'm a tool provider, and I can use them in uh, hopefully creative ways, I would like to think. I want to take you into a different area. This is not about Go. This is about computers writing text. Um, and this is a short um, movie clip that I want to play. I hope the sound is working. It's from a movie called Sunspring. Has anyone heard about Sunspring? Yeah, one person in the back. Okay, so Sunspring is interesting. It actually came out of like a science fiction writing contest that was held at the Barbican in London. Um, most people, uh, most participants were human in the context, um, but one wasn't. Um, that participant was uh, what's called a recurrent neural network, the same type of network that we used for our summarization prototype. Um, and they trained the neural network using a lot of like sci-fi books, essentially. They fed it like a whole bunch of sci-fi books and sort of say, look at those. This is what we want you to do, right? And the neural network is able to sort of learn the patterns in there. And then they turned it on and it, it produced a script. Um, and then creative people took the script and turned it into a movie, and I want to show you a little bit from that movie, and I'm going to ask you afterwards um, about things that you noticed. I am not a bright light. Well, I have to uh, go to the skull. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> See the money. <laughs> All right, you can't tell me that. Yeah, I was coming to that thing, you know, because you're so pretty. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. That's right. So, uh, what are you doing? I don't want to be honest with you. You don't have to be a doctor. <laughs> Sure. I don't know what you're talking about. I want to see you too. What do you mean? I'm sure you wouldn't even touch me. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. So, first of all, the sentence were grammatically correct, right? I think that's remarkable. But what, what did you guys notice? I need a brave volunteer now to share. It didn't make any sense. A any more specific? <laughs> I'm sorry? So to me, the thing that I sort of like when I first watched this was um, how often people say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. 
And in part that is because if you think about sci-fi, a lot of characters in sci-fi are perpetually confused, right? Because things are happening to them that like they don't understand what they're talking about, right? But there's another reason for that, um, and that is that like the way how uh, these algorithms are trained it produces this kind of behavior, and it's good to keep in mind in thinking about the realistic promise of smart machines. Um, if I ask you a question and you know the answer, you give me the answer, right? And I ask you a different question, you know the answer, you give me the answer. It's slightly different from the first answer. If you don't know the answer, what are you going to say? I don't know. Exactly. And so these algorithms, they work by predicting the most possible, the most likely answer. And so I don't know happens quite a lot in response to a question because the answer is unique every single time. So every answer has a low probability, but I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about, has a relatively high probability. And that is how this behavior sort of happens. And if you want to sort of collaborate with machines, right, it's good to sort of keep in mind what they pick up on and what they're good at. Um, by the way, they also like interviewed this, uh, this agent afterwards. They asked it, uh, the, the sci-fi writer, they asked it, uh, what is the future of machine written entertainment? It said, it's a bit sudden. I was thinking of the spirit of the men who found me and the children who were all manipulated and full of children. I was worried about my command. I was the scientist of the Holy Ghost. My name is Benjamin. I love that the AI named itself. I think that's really great. <laughs> um, something very briefly, someone here, and I'm sharing it last year for entertainment, but someone took images and they're algorithms that can automatically, capture, uh, automatically generate capture, captures of images, so descriptions of images, which is very useful. This particular person, though, used um, all the lyrics from Taylor Swift songs. The following stories are generated by a neural network. It describes the content of images and is trained on Taylor Swift lyrics. Enjoy. Ah, I give you a man, I don't know what's happening to me, and when I look back at the stage, I say, God, I love you more than I should. <laughs> the girl is telling you, I don't understand what's going on, woman, since you gave me a ride back, I thought, you're a girl. Yeah, yeah. The animals are the only ones alive, I guess, of course. That's what you want to do. I cannot stand it any longer. I love you. So I guess we're getting a sense, right, of what can happen. And people have a tremendous amount of fun, actually, with these sort of algorithms. But they're also really useful. Here, here we come to the realistic part. They are actually being used. So um, some of the stories that you read in the newspapers are actually written by robots these days. Um, especially sort of sports reporting because you have very structured data, right, the results, and then you have relatively, like, text that only needs to be informative, not creative. And that is what machines can write these days. And I think that's really cool. Um, you can also use it to sort of actually generate captions that make sense. I'm showing a few examples here. That's also really good if you need to attach metadata to images to make them more searchable. Again, that now can be automated. So while a lot of the results are sort of like, you know, fragile, we're, we're exploring new grounds here, right? Like, we can actually use some of them already in practice, and they are being used in practice. And in fact, what's funny is, like, now within finance, some companies auto generate their financial reports so that humans can read them, but then the other companies that are supposed to consume them have, again, machines that then take these sort of like summaries and read them in. And so now we have created a world where machines talk to one another, but we pretend that a human is still listening. Um, so what's the recipe, again, for successful machine learning AI products? It's known components, machine learning tools and algorithms, clever combination of components into a system applied to a well-understood problem, also here. Now the challenge is how do we promise, how do we separate promise from hype? Because if you want to get real about using some of those technologies in your work, that is something that you need to be able to do. Um, and the truth here is that most algorithms have been around for quite a long time. So reinforcement learning, which go back to the Go playing agent, that is at the heart of the success of the Go playing agent. The textbook that people refer to these days when it comes to reinforcement learning is from 1998, right? So um, 19 years old, and it's still sort of current, and that shows you that these algorithms have happened around for a long time. Um, so it is not algorithmic breakthroughs that sort of cover this, and I show this here because I think that a lot of us think that it's algorithmic breakthrough because of the way that we talk about science. We talk about science in a way where it sort of emphasizes. It's like the great man history of science where you have sort of a great man and very often a man that comes along and has an insight. Like 
Alan Turing and how he's portrayed in the imitation game, but that is, in fact, not how science happens. It's a lot more incremental, and it's a collaborative process, many people working together, and so it is not sort of the breakthrough in algorithms, despite how it is described. And so at Fast Forward, of course, in our work, we need to be able to break through the hype. We need to be able to separate like what's, what's real and what isn't. Um, and so here are the factors that we look at. And it's, uh, again, it's sort of very similar to, it echoes a bit the talk that came before me. So we look at, are there new data? Because fundamentally, machine learning is enabled by data. Are there new data sets? And of course, the sort of like, the move where we live a lot of our lives now in, in digital creates much more accessible data streams. Wikipedia, all of Twitter, all of Facebook, incredible data. Um, is there a change in economics? So for example, has um, compute power become cheaper? Has storage become cheaper? That means that we will store more data and also companies will have more access to it. Again, something else is like a capability becomes a commodity. In my world, that's Hadoop. It's a database system. It's TensorFlow. It's a library for deep learning. But it seems that there are also lots of tools now with a new community that really are becoming a commodity. People can use them much more easily now. And that will help increase adoption. It will make something that is impossible much more possible and eventually real. And then, yes, there are, increment, there are algorithmic breakthroughs, but they're incremental and they're listed last. So we always ask ourselves at Fast Forward, why is X more possible today than yesterday? And that's sort of how we do it, and we look at those factors. And that's how we have decided on the research that we had put out to date. Um, so here you see the, the reports that, that have come out of the lab. Um, and briefly, I want to sort of end on this note that I'm often sort of asked by companies, like, so how do we compare, like, as a company, as an industry to other industries? Like, we work across industries because we're toolmakers. We're sort of, like, industry agnostic to an extent. So we, I often get asked, was well, everyone using it? Am I the only one that's not using it, right? And no, and I'm putting this up simply to show that AI and deep learning is very much on the top here. Um, and it is on the top because you need to do all these other things that are on the bottom of the pyramid in order to actually think about using some of these more advanced algorithms. You need to collect your data, move it, store it, understand it, clean it, um, see if there are any sort of bugs in it. And so it takes a very long time and investment to get there. So reality is few companies these days use AI, and most companies, in fact, are not ready for AI, but everyone will be affected by it. You, if you've watched House of Cards, you are already affected by it, because Netflix figured out lots of users watch the movie The Social Network, which was directed by David Fincher from beginning to end, because they try when you stop watching. The BBC miniseries that House of Cards was based on was well received. Those who watched the British version of House of Cards also watched Kevin Spacey films and or films directed by David Fincher. So they made House of Cards and it was a hit, right? So this kind of data really designs products these days. Um, it also, now a company called Stitch Fix uses it to design clothing. Um, why are not more companies getting ready for AI? Well, I think the real problem is that it's this. Um, so I said I'm a toolmaker, right? I know the components. I hope that I can put them together in a clever manner. Um, I've worked now in sort of finance, media, healthcare, those sort of areas. Um, I understand the problem somewhat, but I'm not a domain expert, and I really rely on people knowing the problems and understanding the problems, understanding which conveniences can be exploited, understanding which kind of data is out there in order to actually build um, those smart machines. So the question here is basically, where in your practice do you generate data? And there seems to be lots of it. Uh, when you run simulations, there's a lot of data that comes out of it that can be hard to understand if you don't find a way to simplify it. Um, where in your practice do you make use of data, right? Like, I think it's really interesting to look at how people, like, I mean, this might be my sort of naive assumption here, but how people move through buildings, where do they linger, right? And how does that relate back to, like, how the buildings were designed, the floor plans, those constructions, right? There's a lot more now data that we capture that we can use to actually you know, really monitor. You can also use it to sort of, like, monitor the health. You can create automated alerts. You can automatically detect anomalies, for example, in data streams. All of that could be really interesting. Because fundamentally, data is raw material, and machine learning and AI provides tools. And what we need really are good problems to solve. And by good, I mean useful and suitable for machine learning. And I think what's important in that conversation is that a lot of there's a lot of conversation sort of around of like doomsday scenarios about like AI, the robots will kill us, right? Um, they will take over. The singularity is coming. Um, I think that's kind of misguided, it's not helpful, it's not constructive. Instead, we should think about it more as sort of a collaboration and we need to figure out how we can actually collaborate with machines. A lot of these algorithms these days, they're black boxes. It's sort of the equivalent, if you refuse to talk to me, we can't really 
collaborate, right? And so we need to figure out how to best talk to these algorithms, how to make them understandable to us, right? Um, how we can interact with them. And I think that's an interesting challenge. And I think we should also not forget that, like, because we are exploiting conveniences, if we sort of, we can trick algorithms pretty easily and then it sort of reveals how stupid they ultimately are. And I kind of want to end on that note by showing my, my last video. And you see here, it's a self-driving car, ooh, ooh, new technology. And um, it wants to take a break. And so it goes on this uh, kind of parking lot. Self-driving cars learn that you can cross dotted lines. So that's really great. It sees a dotted line and wants to cross it. But it has also learned that you can't cross a solid line. <laughs> and that's how you can trap a self-driving car if you ever want one. <laughs> and I think it really shows the point, right? Like machines are good at some things and we are good at other things. And so really what we need to figure out is we have more of this technology is like, how, how do, what are they smart at? What are we good at, right? And how do we best combine that? And I'm really excited to sort of think about how some of these techniques could be used in your industry. Again, I'm, I'm really like the fly on the wall. I'm going to be back here on Sunday for those who are here during the hackathon, and I'd love to actually just chat a bit more. Thank you.